And who else is, would like to, would have a question, please pop up your hand. Okay, I've got another person over here by the, by the pillar. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Dina Shalom. Um, mm -hmm. My question is, any thoughts, or do you have any thoughts about working with this one-on-one -on -one versus in a group class? Oh, actually, I think, I think that a lot of the people that, that when you're getting them to start into yoga, it would be a lot better, or actually any movement practice, to start one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, because we really have to see how the person responds when we get the person to move. And a lot of guidance is often really necessary. Um, most of the people who um, come into a yoga class who've never had any sort of one-on-one, -on -one, they, they often don't succeed as well. Because right? you know, how you're going to breathe, how you're going to move in a certain way is, is so unique. So I, I teach therapeutic yoga classes. When people come in, I usually see them one, two, or three times on one-on-one, -on -one, and then they, they seem to succeed. This is seem, right? This is not research. This is they seem to succeed so much better when you do that. Because really, we've got to get people to stop competing with the other people in the room, stop competing with what they used to be able to do. And of course, the other competition that we always do is we compete with what we think the teacher thinks we should be able to do. It's sort of weird, but we, we predict what the teacher might think, and then we compete with that. So we've got to try to get a lot of that stuff out of the way for people to succeed with this, usually. Right? And of course, a lot of people think that yoga is about standing on your head, so it's really nice to show them that there's this gentle aspect of yoga that you can use to try to work in all this other work. Yeah. Okay, we have another question up here. She's got her hand. And we've got another one back here. Okay. And Hi, I'm Jenna Rubin, and um, I'm an applied movement science major at uh, San Diego State. And I just noticed that a lot of yoga practices, they incorporate music into the program. And I was wondering how you feel about music in terms of <laughs> pain reception or in yoga in general, Right. or research on okay. that. Uh, it's not so much research. Well, we've got research that says that music can be really calming for your physiology, and that could be good. My belief is that what we're trying to do is get people to change their nervous system. And sometimes music actually gets you to focus externally and not take your awareness inside. And so what I would do if you were asking me as an individual who is coming to my class, I would say, when you listen to music, does it allow you to pay attention to yourself and body better? And if you said yes, I'd say, well, okay, well, let's, let's have you listen to some music. Because I want you to be able to pay attention to the stuff you're trying to change. If you said to me, music takes me outside and I get totally in the music and I'm really not paying attention to my inter interoceptive stuff, I'd say, it's, listen to music sometimes. But when you're trying to change your nervous system, you need to be focused on trying to feel your body and change it. That would be my view. Yeah. Next question right here in the back, and then we've got this gentleman up front. Hi, Neil. Um, I'm Susie. Um, I wanted to ask you how you felt about weekend certification courses <laughs> for different things like yoga and Pilates, and what your background is in yoga. Oh, OK. Um, I've been practicing meditation for a long, long time, and I actually came to yoga um, because my meditation teacher said, you know, you're so stiff, you'll never be able to sit still long enough to be able to actually meditate you want to do, so you should go to yoga. Um, and so that's where I came into my yoga practice from, from that aspect. Um, I mean, I, I've trained with so many different people that that probably is less relevant in terms of the yoga bit, but in terms of... Um, well, now I've forgotten the first part of the question that you said. Weekend certification. Weekend certifications. I think you know the answer to that. Um, I mean, I, I, I think if you want to teach people how to move, uh, you, can, you might be able to do it with a we weekend thing. But I think it doesn't really help you keep people safe. And if we're talking about therapeutic yoga, I think you need to know so much more than that. Yeah, I, just to elaborate on that, I just did wanted to, um, to be clear that mm -hmm. Uh, it's just because we're physical therapists doesn't mean that we should be inclined to teach a movement technique that we may not be fully mm. certified in, or how do you feel about that statement? Yeah, well, I think that if you want to use the aspects of, some aspects of yoga as a physical therapist, go right ahead. If you want to be a yoga teacher, go get trained as a yoga teacher. It'd be the same as Pilates. One other thing I'd mention about that is sometimes when I teach healthcare people and I teach them like a two or three day course and really get into this, one of my big messages at the end of it is, do not walk out of here thinking you understand this. This is a highly, highly complex thing and my job is to try to make it more easy to understand, but this is the beginning. You, you can't walk out of here and think you understand pain and everybody who's got it. 
right? But there's this arrogance that often happens in any of these trainings when you take this small bit, because as teachers, our job is to make it more easily understandable. But often we miss the complexity of it around it, and you only get that once you've been in it for a long, long, long time. And I would say if you're going to teach meditation or if you're going to teach yoga, you need to practice it yourself. If you don't have your own personal practice, it's really hard to do it. Although you have to make sure you're not egocentric about that, right? Because whatever works for you doesn't necessarily work for me, right? Yeah. That leads right into my question, which, which I, got, I got into somatic work through yoga initially, um, and I'm not doing it at the moment, but um, there are widely varying standards for yoga teacher certification, like in California, 200-hour minimum. Mm. Um, and if someone is presenting with a clinical pain problem, you know, seeing a clinician, you don't necessarily just want to refer them to any yoga class. So I'm wondering, yeah. would you start them out with someone who is a clinician and a yoga teacher, which may be a rare combination, mm -hmm. or do you have like a short list of yoga teachers that you trust and would send them off to? Well, you, could, you can go and look at um, uh, the International Association of Yoga Therapists to try to find more people. There's actually a group, uh, a Facebook page group that's all rehab professionals who are also yoga teachers. It's called Bridge Builders. That's Matt Taylor, the guy at the back, sort of created all that. He's got his arms crossed, looking angry right now. Um, but uh, there, aren't, there aren't a whole lot of places where you can go for this. And it's actually one of the things that I think that we need to consider is if you're going to ask someone to go do yoga, get to know a yoga teacher and start to have a team with them, right? If you're a yoga, you know, the, the programs that I teach integrate healthcare people with yoga teachers because we need both. If you're going to do the two together, then do the two together. Right? I think that's where you're getting at is so key is you need that, right? Um, yeah. Next question. Arms nice and high. Going, going, going. Okay. So oh, I, there's one. Oh, sorry. I, I, I did see it. Um, hi, I'm Bill Rubine. So I'm, I work with the Yoga of Awareness program. We talked about that. Yeah. I think, so they're, they're basically working with fibro patients mainly. Right. And I, I think that their approach to fibro patients is to release negative emotions and relax. What she talks about all the time is relaxation in the context of movement. Yes. That's like her phrase. So I've seen patients get better there where they, they, they don't push too hard. They kind of calm everything down and then they start to get some relief and then they start to move on from there. Yes. But honestly, I think I've seen more fibro patients get better from just kind of uh, sucking it up and just like I'm going to have pain if I exercise, I'm going to have pain if I don't and they just get on with it just in my own experience. Mm. So I was wondering what your experience is with that. <laughs> People are different. Some, some people uh, gravitate to the more aggressive movement practices. Maybe I can give you this. this. In Toronto, there's a big yoga conference, and I was teaching that a few years ago about pain stuff, and they interviewed me on the radio. And uh, I was a little naive. I hadn't done a lot of radio interviews. And the pre person asked me, if someone had a chronic pain condition, what sort of yoga would you suggest they don't go to? Which it was really dumb that I answered the question. But part of the answer I said was, you know, when people have really wound up cranky nervous system, when they're really feeling highly sensitized, probably the more aggressive, you know, uh, active, acrobatic, gymnastic yogas, and the, here's where the mistake I made was, like Bikram's or Ashtanga, uh, might not be the best thing to do. And I actually got um, phone calls the next day from people with fibromyalgia, specifically a, a, two different women with fibromyalgia contacted me the next day to say, stop saying that. The, ones, the one said, I tried all the Mambi Pambi restorative, lay there, meditate, yoga, and it didn't work. Ashtanga worked, right? And so she was actually quite upset with me. Of course, I wanted to ask her, well, do you think the Ashtanga worked because you had done all this other stuff beforehand? Right? Because it's possible, but we don't know. So, but I would really say is that I don't know. We don't have the evidence around this, and some people seem to do better with, with uh, something more energetic for a lot of reasons that we don't understand. Right? The whole push through pain to get better thing, I, I, it's not where I would say people would go, but some people go there and get better, and it just leaves us all going, I don't understand that. It's, but the point is it's complex, right? You know, pain is so multifaceted, how could you figure it out just because you're saying this particular mechanical stimulation should make you worse? But that is Rene Descartes' idea. 
it's not our idea of pain, right? Another question back here. Yep. Gentlemen. This question comes to you all the way from Brazil. <laughs> Hello, my name is Rafael. Uh, uh, I, I, I was trying to to read some some things that was presented uh, this weekend, and I, I myself as a therapist, I'm a physical therapist. I used like manual techniques to try to calm the body right. of my patient, and like Corey uh, did, and you said in, your, in the beginning of your presentation, I used some similar techniques to, to, to show that the pain edge uh, could be moving. Right. And this will uh, make uh, his body feel better. Do you believe that with meditation, you can calm down the mind of the person and use this as a part of the treatment? Because uh, I've been through uh, meditation myself for mm -hmm. uh, some years. Yeah. And I practice uh, not, not yoga, but Kung Fu. And it's mm -hmm. And in some aspect, it's very similar. Yeah. And I try to make my patients understand that, or not understand what I'm trying to say, but what his his mind is yeah. not uh, is not permitting him to do anymore. You know. So let's calm down. And how how do you use do you use this? Absolutely. Okay. There's there's I think there's a lot of people as they start to try to move. There's so much, for better lack of a better word, wind up. There's so much sensitivity sensitization or so much tension that when the person starts to move they they don't seem to be able to succeed so I actually use a lot of biofeedback so I'll actually get people to do breathing practice or meditation or relaxation whatever it is while a person can actually see on a screen how they're doing and one of the really interesting things I've noticed is that is just with breathing techniques is sometimes you get a person to breathe calmly and you they say it feels calm and I'll say tell me when you start to really feel calm and a lot of times when people say, oh, I'm really feeling calm now, the biofeedback stuff hasn't changed at all yet. Right? And so they need to do it longer before they, you can actually measure changes in skin conductance or heart rate variability or, muscle, or EMG muscle tension, all those things. So it's, it's interesting. Is, so the answer is yes, these things are important, I think, for a lot of people. Not everybody, but a lot. But also to consider is that a lot of times we need to do them longer than you would normally expect to really get the good measurable physiological changes. And that's purely a clinical observation. I can't tell you any research that has actually looked at that at all. Actually, uh, I believe that one of the greatest problems is what you say, that it takes time. Yeah. Practice. And the practice is useful to our uh, culture that says, OK, you need to practice. Exactly, yeah. So he was saying that our, our culture wants it now, yeah. and we need to teach treat these things as the physical change of, of, that we're trying to get through any of these techniques, right? We need to recognize you're trying to change the nervous system, and typically the nervous system needs time to practice. And so if you give people a, a technique and, and they come back a week later and they say it didn't work, well, the very first thing you need to ask is how long were you able to do it, right? Because maybe they actually weren't able to do it long enough, there wasn't enough dose to actually change the nervous system in, in, in a productive way which would be our guess, right? Yeah. That brings us to the end of our question answer time. So, Neil Pierce.